We are continuing our survey here in the uh, Gospels. And this evening, what we're going to do is to uh, uh, pick up the time uh, in the uh, late fall, just following the fall festivals of 29 A.D., uh, we're, we'll pick it up in the late fall of 29 and uh, follow through about six months up until just before the Passover of 30 A.D. So uh, uh, this was a time during which Jesus was uh, pursuing his Galilean ministry. What A lot of times what people don't realize is that Jesus Christ during his ministry spent a comparatively very short time in the area of Judea and Jerusalem. Uh, a little bit went a long way. And when he spent very much time there, uh, the, the pot boiled over quickly. Uh, but uh, Galilee was a very populous area. In fact, it was the most populous part. And uh, there, uh, Christ spent time going throughout the cities and towns of, of Galilee. And that's where most of his uh, mighty works and miracles were done. And he even alludes to that. Now, the section that we're getting into uh, this evening uh, deals with some of the parables. You know, parables uh, serve both to clarify and to obscure. Uh, most people think, well, you know, Christ told parables to, so that everybody can understand what he meant. Well, no, that's exactly the opposite of what, what the Scripture says. And yet, parables do make things clear and understandable if you know the key to the parable. You know, a number of times after Christ had told a parable, uh, the disciples came to him afterward and they said, Lord, what exactly did you mean? What, what, was that, what was that about? And then he would explain to them the key to the parable and everything just sort of uh, opened up. Uh, one thing I think we have to be careful of in a parable, realize that the parable was told to illustrate uh, a basic truth. And any sort of illustration begins to break down if you start going through trying to find special significance about every single word and everything that was, uh, you know, that was mentioned. Uh, Christ emphasized the things we're supposed to get out of it, and and the parable. Uh, paints a word picture. You know, it uses something, and once you understand the point that he was driving at which unless he explained it, you wouldn't, uh, then it, it, it opens it up. And no parable, no illustration gives the a complete picture. It only gives an aspect. That's why there are many parables where he said, well, the kingdom of, of heaven is like. And it's like this, and it's like that, and it's like something else. Because no one physical illustration totally sums up everything about the kingdom, but various things... Uh, will illustrate different points. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke follow through uh, as, in fact, well, the commentators generally refer to them as the synoptic Gospels. Uh, what is recognized is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, have many parallels. The story that they contain is similar, where John uh, focuses in on different material. John was written much later, and he didn't need to go back and retell the story that, that they did. Now, you find that there are differences between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, the differences had to do, of course, with the style and with the emphasis. Um, Matthew is more concerned about subject matter than chronology. One of the reasons that we often go to Matthew's account is he tends to give the most complete uh, description of what Christ said tends to get, you go to the Sermon on the Mount, you go to the Isle of that Prophecy, you go to many of these things. Realize that over a period of three and a half years, how many multiple hundreds of sermons did Jesus Christ get? Sermons and talks. Realize that in many of those, there was undoubtedly overlap. But it wasn't word for word. You know, he would emphasize certain things depending on the audience, depending on the circumstances, depending on a lot of things. So, on a particular subject, Jesus may have, on a particular occasion, given a, a discourse on this subject, but he probably touched on that subject who knows how many other times. What Matthew tends to do 
is to bring together what Christ said on a given subject from maybe more than one occasion. As he follows through sort of a rough chronological point, but when he, he gets focused in on the subject matter. Mark, on the other hand, uh, tends to... Uh, uh, Mark and Luke follow... Uh, a little more of a chronological approach in giving the account of the life of Christ, and Mark perhaps even more so than Luke. Uh, M- Matthew follows chronology in a, in a general sense, but is more oriented toward the subject matter. So um, what we will often do through the, uh, the course of the study is that uh, uh, we will follow Mark through as sort of the basic story and then we'll uh, and, uh, go to Matthew and Luke uh, to uh, fill in details. Now we pick up uh, the story here in, uh, uh, in Mark chapter 4. The uh, Mark 4, of course, started out uh, with... Uh, um, Christ teaching many things by parables. And as we come on down, he talks about the parable of the sower and the seed. As he comes on down in uh, verse 21 of Mark 21, uh, Mark 4, excuse me, not 21 chapters in Mark, are there? Uh, 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 Mark 4, 21. He said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? Well, that's a pretty obvious question. You know, the reason you have a candle is set it up uh, so people can see it. It's to illuminate a room. There's nothing hidden which shall not be manifested, neither anything kept secret that it shall not come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, the, uh, you know, what he's saying here is in the context of what he has set up earlier here in Mark 4. Uh, you know, in Mark 4, 9, after he had told a parable, he said unto them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, verse 10, uh, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without. All these things are done in parables. So it was really not the time for everyone to understand. And he explained the keys, uh, you see, and began to... Uh, to, to explain certain things. But he made the point on down in verse 21, you know, none, none of this is intended to be permanently hidden. At the appropriate time, you know, it's, it's there to be, uh, uh, to be understood. And uh, he said in verse 24, uh, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. Uh, with the way you measure it out. You know, take heed what you hear. You know, that's an important thing for us to realize. It's easy for, for us to uh, take for granted the truth. I had opportunity to visit uh, with two different individuals uh, this week. Uh, one man up in the Oklahoma City area on Sunday and then uh, this new couple here this afternoon. And when you're talking to somebody who's new, who's been watching the telecast for a while, gotten a few booklets, uh, you know, it impresses upon you afresh the the fact that we tend to take a lot of things for granted. Oh, we've heard that. You know, I sort of, oh, we, we, we know all that. And Christ said, you know, take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet it out, it'll be measured to you again. Unto you that hear shall more be given. You know, if you take and apply what you learn, God will open your mind to understand more. But it's it's important for us to take seriously what we hear, not to treat it lightly and casually. So uh, uh, he uh, uh, goes on down and tells and gives uh, uh, other parables. He, he uh, says uh, in verse 26, The kingdom of God is like a man uh, casting seed into the ground. And uh, uh, he rises, he should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed and spring and grow up. He knows not how. The earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after the full corn in the ear. When the fruit is brought forth immediately, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So 
You know, how is it that of millions of people who hear the truth, in some it takes root and it begins to grow, and in others it doesn't? You know, you go out and plant seed. How is it that that little seed can produce this plant and all these things? Well, uh, he says, uh, what's the comparison of the kingdom of God? Well, verse 31, he's, he says it's like a mustard seed. Uh, it's a tiny little seed, smaller than other seeds, and yet you plant it and it grows and becomes great and uh, puts out, you know, branches and leaves and birds come and nest in it. And, and uh, uh, so, you know, that's, that, that is... Uh, uh, he goes on down. Uh, the uh, let's let's just uh, sort of hold our place here, and let's go back to Matthew 13, because Matthew 13 gives the uh, the parable of uh, gives these parables. Uh, the parable of the sower and the seed is uh, 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 up earlier, and then uh, uh, he comes on down in uh, Matthew chapter. Uh, uh, 13, he talks about uh, the kingdom of God, verse 44, treasure hidden in a field, uh, merchant man seeking goodly pearls, verse 45. We went through some of that last time. And uh, uh, then uh, the kingdom is like a net. Um, and uh, so he told... Uh, uh, he told all these these parables. Now he mentioned the mustard seed uh, up in verse thirty one, Matthew thirteen thirty one. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. We read it uh, there in Mark. And then Matthew describes another parable that he told that uh, whether or not he spoke it at the same time, it illustrated the same principle. So Matthew included it with this. Another parable he spoke unto them, verse thirty three. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until it was all leaven. All these things spoke, Jesus spoke unto that multitude in parables without a parable. He didn't speak anything. Now, uh, he was drawing the analogy of the kingdom being likened to a grain of mustard seed, likened to leaven. The factor, the common factor in both of those is something that starts out in a very tiny way and then grows to be large and great. Uh, you know, when Christ came, the knowledge and understanding of God's way was taught only to a handful of disciples. At the end of his three and a half years of ministry, there were 120 disciples. You know, Isaiah 11 talks about a time when the earth will be covered with the knowledge of God. When, when uh, the knowledge of God will, you know, God's word will go out from Jerusalem and, and all nations. So here's something that starts out very, very tiny. Jesus initially calls out a handful of individuals and starting in a very tiny, insignificant way. Me. How much more insignificant can you get? You know, as the Romans looked at it, uh, Judea was about as insignificant a place as they had in the empire. It was this little uh, troublesome spot over here. Uh, that's a pretty insignificant place. And uh, here we've got this, this, as they looked at it, you know, this insignificant Jew because all Jews were pretty insignificant. and uh, You know, here's this insignificant Jew and a handful of other insignificant Jews. And, and uh, you know, what does that count for? Well, folks are going to find out in a few years, you know, when uh, that so-called insignificant Jew returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the twelve apostles were raised up in glory and power and sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. You see, it's like... The leavening is used here. You know, one the same thing can the same physical thing can illustrate different points. Leavening spreads it, it, that ingredient or that quality of, of uh, you know of spreading. You put in just a little bit uh, in a uh, you know in with the flour and, and, and to make a dough, but it permeates. It spreads, and uh, so that uh, that's a key thing. Now here. Uh, as uh, in Matthew 13, uh, continuing on, uh, let, let's notice a little bit uh, of the uh, uh, this matter of the tares. In uh, Matthew 13, he uh, in verse 24 he likened the kingdom 
kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that sows good feed in feed, good seed in his field. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And it sprung up, but the tares came up also. The servants of the householder came and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did all these tares come from? He said, Well, an enemy has done it. And the, tares, and the servant said, You want us to go try to pull them all out? He said, No, because while you're doing that, you'll root up some of the wheat with them. Let them grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, uh, I'll tell the reapers to gather first the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them. Gather the wheat into my barn. Well, it comes on down, and Jesus explained this parable. See, they ask him in verse 36, Declare to us the parable of the tares. And he said, Well, he that sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. The tares, he says, this is the way it will be. Son of man will send forth his angels. Verse 41, shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. They will be burned up. And the righteous will shine as the sun. So, what we find in this parable, interestingly, is that we see tares sown in among the wheat. You know, and that's that means that there are things, as we have seen even in our experience over the years, there are sometimes uh, those who are in the church physically, but they're not in the church spiritually. You see, ultimately, the difference between the tear and the wheat is the tear never brings forth fruit. Oh, it may look sort of like wheat when it's coming up. That's the difficulty. But the issue is settled once the fruit has developed because ultimately the wheat brings forth fruit and is of value to be harvested. The tares never bring forth fruit. Can you always tell the tares from the wheat? Well, not early on. In fact, uh, sometimes it's a matter that things, you know, are simply allowed to grow together, and, and there are some things that only God can sort out. Some things become obvious, and, you know, there are other scriptures that show that there is a matter of church discipline. There are things that have to be dealt with. But sometimes it's, it's a matter we can't figure everything out. If you try to root out every tear, you're going to undoubtedly rip up some wheat with it. And so, you know, we see that. Ultimately, the tares are represented, representative of, of those, that, those things that offend and which do iniquity, which practice lawlessness. So uh, there are those, you know, over the years um, who could not understand why certain problems maybe existed. I don't know about you. When I uh, came into the church, I remember when I went out to Ambassador College, I, I knew I wasn't perfect, but I figured everybody else was. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just I knew that everybody was doing everything. I mean, that's, it said, you know, we were supposed to do it, so surely they were. And uh, uh, I figured if I could get out there and sort of get around it, well, surely, you know, it sort of rub off on me, you know. And you begin to realize, well, it's not perfect. And sometimes you didn't realize how many problems there were because everything wasn't obvious. You're new, and you know it's. Uh, but yeah, God has allowed Satan sometimes to sow some tears in among the wheat, and uh, every problem is not going to get solved in the here and now. I mean, we just have to recognize that. Christ said it. You read the New Testament, and you find out it was true in the first century. And uh, my experience tells me it's been true <laughs> in this century. I suspect most of you have come to realize that. So, uh, you know, this, yes, yeah, certain problems and offenses uh, will occur uh, until Christ comes back and solves the whole problem. The, uh, so as, as we... Uh, uh, you know, as we come on down, that uh, uh, the uh, the account here of the parables, we're, we're told that he didn't expound anything 
uh, didn't uh, teach the multitudes anything except that he used parables. Uh, Mark 4.34 and, and the parallel in Matthew says the same thing, that uh, without a par- parable he didn't speak to them. And then when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So he sent away the multitude, and uh, uh, they were going to cross over uh, to cross over the Sea of Galilee uh, to the area of the Gadarenes. Now, uh, let's uh, go back here. In uh, uh, we'll come back here to. Uh, uh, Matthew 8 and uh, uh, as we get the uh, uh, as we uh, get the account and uh, get some uh, get some of the details because uh, uh, Matthew chapter 8 tells the uh, the story uh, here we'll pick it up uh, let's see on down about verse uh, uh, verse 22 this is uh, after he had uh, come back across to Capernaum and uh, was uh, here he sees the multitudes and uh, verse 19 a certain scribe came said unto him master I'll follow you wherever you go And uh, uh, Christ said, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man doesn't have where to lay his head. Another disciple said, Well, Lord, let me first go uh, and bury my father, then I'll be able to come back and really follow. And Christ said, Well, follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. And uh, uh, when he was entered into the ship, his disciples followed, and there arose a great tempest. And... uh, uh, it comes on down in verse 28 uh, where he, he calmed the waters and then in verse 28 they entered into the uh, country of the uh, Gergesenes or Gadarenes just alternate uh, spellings of the same thing and uh, uh, the uh, we, we have the account of, of uh, the individual being the uh, Matthew records that there were actually two individuals uh, and the demons were cast out and went into the swine so the account here in the latter part of Matthew 8 matches up this account with uh, what we were seeing uh, in uh, uh, Mark, chapter, uh, uh, Mark chapter 4 and 5. I want to comment on this matter of letting the dead bury the dead. Uh, you know, was Christ being callous and hard-hearted and saying, well, you know, don't go to your father's funeral? Uh, no. I mean, plenty of other scriptures uh, certainly show that. The... Uh, uh, the point Christ was making, in effect, what this fellow was saying was, look, once my father's dead and all everything's been settled up, then I'll be able to come back and really concentrate on following you. You know, but I better go back and sort of see after things and, uh, you know, take care of everything at home. And, and uh, then once it's all over with, well, then I'll, I'll be your disciple. And Christ said, and said, let the dead bury their dead. Uh, let the, the spiritual dead, you know, those that, that are not being called, those that God is not working with right now. In effect, he was using the fact that he had an elderly father at home as an excuse to put off acting on the calling that Christ had given him. And so Christ was telling them, let the spiritual dead uh, bury the dead. In other words, he had plenty of unconverted relatives who could fulfill the physical duties that he had, but not the spiritual duties that he had. So we have the account... Um, as uh, um, here, where they uh, they crossed, the, they got on the boat, and Christ went to sleep, and the storm got worse and worse, and they were scared. And the storm must have been bad because these were experienced uh, uh, men of the water, you know, experienced sailors, and they said, "Lord, save us! We're about to die." In verse twenty-six of Matthew 8, he said, Why are you so fearful, you of little faith? He arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. The men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey? Can you imagine, you know, 
the, the shock effect. They had seen Jesus perform miracles. But, you know, he was somebody that they lived with day in and day out. And in the midst of a storm, to wake up somebody and to see them simply look out at the storm and say, Peace, be still, and all of a sudden the wind stops and the water becomes like glass, you know, that would have to be just an overwhelming thing. It's like, what? You know, what manner of man is this? I mean, this is just, uh, this goes so far beyond anything we could have even imagined happening. You know, the wind and the sea obey it. Well, you know, he's the one that spoke the words and commanded the sea to be gathered in one place. He's the one that said, let there be light. He's the one uh, that, that initially commanded these things to come into action. Of course they obeyed him. You know, his voice was the one that called them into existence. They didn't understand that at that time. You know, that, that was something that sort of gradually dawned. But uh, we, we have the account. Uh, you know, Matthew and, and Mark both give it. They, uh, 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 Luke, in chapter 8, gives parallel as well as they... Uh, uh, as, as they uh, 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 entered here, and uh, it tells about the uh, arriving at the country of the Gadarenes. Uh, Luke eight twenty six gives a, gives another parallel, uh, and again the preceding account is of the uh, storm being still. That's why I say if you follow it through in Mark and Luke. Then you look back to Matthew, you realize how Matthew sort of jumps around, but you can, using Mark and Luke as sort of your chronology, you can line up the parallel accounts from Matthew, and you often find Matthew gives more details, though he tended to jump around a little more. But the, the point of the thing was that they, uh, uh, they came and they met this individual or individuals with unclean spirits, and uh, uh, we find that... Uh, uh, Christ rebuked the uh, the demons. In this case, it was multiple demons. I said, uh, uh, you know, my name is Legion, which referred to this, you know, great multitude. We are many. And that sometimes, you know, that's uh, uh, sometimes the case. I, I know of sometimes multiple uh, demons that are involved, sometimes just one. This individual had, uh, had many. And uh, uh, anyway, they... Uh, Christ allowed them to go into the herd of swine, and uh, uh, the uh, swine, when the when the uh, unclean spirits, as uh, Mark brings out in Mark uh, five thirteen, when they went out and entered into the swine, the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about two thousand, and they were choked in the sea. And of course, the people that were there watching the swine fled. It scared them to death. They ran into the city and and. Uh, uh, told everybody they saw. And uh, when people came out there, here was Legion, who had been known, you know, as this uh, insane, violent individual. Uh, he was sitting there clothed in his right mind. He was just, you know, seemed normal as anybody. And uh, uh, when they saw what had happened, they wanted him to leave. They wanted Jesus to leave. It just scared them to death. The, the, uh, uh, what had uh, uh, transpired, you know, the God's power. Uh, they they were terrified. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all uh, give the, uh, uh, you know, give the account. Uh, and um, down in uh, verse, uh, uh, I guess, thir- uh, thirty-seven says that the uh, Luke eight says the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about uh, besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and returned back again. And the man from whom he had uh, cast out the demons uh, wanted to go with him, but Jesus told him, you know, you go back home and you show everyone the great things that God has done with you, has done for you. So uh, then we come to the account, uh, Luke and Mark show, of uh, coming back here to the... He crossed over and came to the town, and this man, Jarius, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And uh, that account 
again is given in, in uh, uh, you know all of the uh, in in those three uh, different accounts of uh, Jarius uh, coming out and uh, uh, this is the uh, Jarius coming out and desiring that uh, uh, you know his daughter uh, be healed you can read in uh, Matthew uh, uh, nine, as well as uh, on down here in uh, Mark chapter five, and uh, Luke chapter uh, eight, and uh, the uh, daughter died before Christ got there, and of course uh, he, Christ, put all the other folks out, took Peter, James, and John with him and the parents, and uh, went in there and told the little girl. Uh, you know, raised her from the dead. That was a, uh, you know, a tremendous miracle as, uh, uh, as that occurred. Uh, Mark uh, gives the account uh, in Mark chapter 5, and uh, Mark adds in a detail that uh, when the ruler had come to him, that in the meantime there was a huge crowd of people. And Mark 5, uh, 25, a certain woman that had an issue of blood 12 years. She had gone to every doctor she could find, and she had spent all her money, and uh, you know she was no better off. You know she just uh, poor woman. There's no telling what all sort of remedies they put her through, but uh, nothing, uh, nothing solved her problem. And uh, she had heard of Jesus, and had heard about this, and so uh, she came up there and just reached out to touch his garment. And. She had in her mind, if I can just touch his clothes, I, I know I'll be healed. So she clearly had come to real faith and, and to really believe uh, that he was not just some ordinary rabbi. You know, she, really, she felt like, I don't need to do anything if I can just get close enough to touch his clothes. Well, immediately the blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of the plague, in verse, uh, Mark 5.29. Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue was gone out of him, turned about and said, Who touched me? Well, the disciples said, What do you mean who touched you? You know, there's folks all around here. Well, no telling how many people touched you. But Jesus meant it in a special way. I mean, he knew it was not just somebody jostling up against him. And he, he looked around to see, and the woman, this frightened her. You know, she thought maybe she was in trouble, and she came and fell down before him and told him everything. And he told her, verse 34 of Mark 5, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Be whole of your plague. And then uh, Mark continues the account of uh, Jairus' uh, daughter and uh, the little girl uh, being, uh, being raised from the dead. And uh, she was, uh, uh, you know, she was an outstanding example of faith. This this particular woman, uh, as we uh, look at that, and we just. You know, you realize here was somebody. There were all sorts of people that heard Jesus and saw him, but how many of them reacted in the uh, uh, in the in the way that this woman did? And she certainly uh, is singled out here in terms of uh, an example of faith. And uh, so, anyway, uh, Mark six one tells us that he went out from thence and came into his own country, and. Uh, uh, his disciples followed him, and when the Sabbath was come, he began to teach in the synagogues, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence has this man these things? Where, where did he get all this stuff? Why, well, we know him, verse 3. This is the carpenter. He's the son of Mary. This is clear indication, of course, that, his, that Joseph was dead by this time, because... Uh, Joseph's name isn't mentioned, uh, but his mother was still alive. He's the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon. They're not his sisters here with us. So Mary was not a perpetual virgin, was she? she had, uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters. And they were offended at it. They said, where does this guy get off saying all this stuff? Why? That's the carpenter. That's the fellow that put an addition on my house. You know, where, where does he get off doing all this stuff? Well, I saw, I know him. You know, he built that place over there across the road, and uh, he did some work for me, and he remodeled over there, and we know all his family. 
They just really took offense at somebody that they knew, somebody that maybe they had hired a few years ago to do uh, work on their house. That How in the world can he come around here and say all this stuff and do all these things? You know, somebody's going to be impressive. They have to be somebody you don't know and they've come from a long way away, right? Uh, if you know them, like, well, he can't be important. I've known him for years. Uh, well, anyway, Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own house. Notice verses 5 and 6, Matthew 6. He could there do no mighty works, except that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. Now, even Jesus Christ could do no mighty works except there were a few individuals who were healed. Because, you know, back in, in uh, the Psalms, I think it's Psalm 78, it talks about uh, limiting the Holy One of Israel. How do you limit God? It talks about Israel of old, Israel in the wilderness, limiting uh, the Holy One of Israel. How do you limit God? Well, we limit Him through unbelief. Yes, that is Psalm 78, Psalm 78, 41. They turned back, tempted God, and limited the Holy One of Israel. How did they limit Him? How did they limit him? Through their unbelief. You know, they limited Jesus Christ right there in Nazareth. They limited him through their unbelief. He marveled because of their unbelief. They just were so uh, calloused and, and just tuned things out. The, uh, uh, as we uh, come on down through the, uh, uh, through the account, what we find next, you see, as you're going through Mark's account in Mark 6, is Mark 6, verse 7. He called his twelve, the twelve and sent them forth two by two. Well, let's go back in Matthew, you see, and we'll pick up the, uh, uh, the uh, parallel uh, account. In the parallel account uh, uh, in Matthew 9 uh, talks about the woman being healed of, of the disease and... Uh, uh, then uh, Mark uh, or Matthew 9:27 talks about the two blind men uh, who were following him, and uh, uh, they came to him, and, and they were following after him, actually, and saying, "Son of David, have mercy on us." And he said, "Do you believe I'm able to do this?" And they said, "Yes." He touched their eyes, and he said, "According to your faith, be it unto you." And their eyes were opened. So. Um, then we find uh, someone who was possessed of a demon. The demon was cast out. The individual was allowed, was able to speak. Uh, the, uh, you know, Christ here showed in the case of the healing of the blind man that, you know, faith is an important quality. He said, according to your faith, be it unto you. And that certainly was many times a factor. And you tie that in with... Uh, where he could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. Well, the Pharisees uh, went around and they were trying to put him down. Chapter 9, verse 34 of Matthew, they said, well, he's just throw, casting out demons through the prince of the demons. Well, Jesus went around the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing the sick. When he saw the multitudes, Matthew 9, 36, he was moved with compassion on you know, that was Christ's attitude. He had compassion on the multitudes. He uh, looked at these people, and he had compassion. They were scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And he said, verse 37, The harvest truly is plenteous, the laborers are few. Pray you, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. You know, he's, there's all of this to, to be done. Well, then, again, we come, Matthew 10 picks it up where he called the twelve, gave them power against unclean spirits uh, to heal diseases, and he sent them out. And uh, Matthew uh, 10, verse 2, begins to name them. You know, the, the name of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who's called Peter, and then it goes on down. And I commented earlier uh, you know, this term uh, protos uh, in, in the Greek, which basically ref it means first, and, and it could, depending on the context, refer to first in uh, chronological order, or it could refer to first in, in importance. 
just like our work first could be. You know, it could have depends on the context. Well, we know when you go back to John 1 and to the parallel accounts that Simon Peter was not the first chronologically to follow Jesus. In fact, his brother Andrew was a follower before Peter. Andrew went and got Peter and said, Here, we found the Messiah. Let me come and introduce you to it. So Peter, in every one of the lists, is always listed first. Now, that didn't mean he was some infallible pope that towered way over everybody else. But on the other hand, uh, you know, there was a certain organization and structure, and Peter was the one that uh, was used as the leader. And, and, you know, there's a balance on things. seems like so often people want to go to one extreme or the other. And uh, uh, they, they, they say, well, you know, we shouldn't have any sort of government or leader. Well, I don't know of anything that function very well like that. You know, if you had more than one person involved, uh, but, you know, there is there is a place somewhere between an infallible pope who uh, uh, speaks ex cathedra and uh, something that's anarchy. Uh, there was, God called these men, and he, uh, Christ uh, trained them and taught them, uh, and yet there was a certain... Uh, uh, Peter was, was singled out as, as the leader. He's even uh, denoted that way here in Matthew's account, the leader of the twelve. Uh, and, of course, we find that normally even Peter, James, and John were often singled out as sort of an inner group. Uh, just uh, that was the way that God chose to work. Well, they were sent to go forth, uh, Matthew 10 says, uh, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And uh, he told them to go and preach and to uh, uh, heal the sick and to cast out demons. And he sent them out uh, not with provision. He told them that uh, as you come on through the story, you see, he says when you, uh, verse 11, into whatever town... Uh, you enter, inquire who in it is worthy, there abide till you go thence. When you come into a house, salute it. If the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. If not, let your peace return to you. And uh, uh, if you uh, look again at the uh, uh, the parallel, uh, uh, you know, the parallel accounts where he uh, uh, sent the. Uh, uh, you know, sent the twelve out. Uh, Luke nine is a parallel where he sent the uh, uh, he uh, sent the twelve out, and uh, uh, Mark also provides uh, provides a uh, you know provides that uh, uh, provides that parallel, and uh, the disciples. You know, when they returned back to him, uh, you know, they were really amazed at all the things that uh, uh, that had happened. Well, Christ told them to go out. Uh, he told them, uh, we were reading Matthew's account of Matthew 10. Uh, he said, I'm sending you forth, in verse 16, uh, like sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Uh, beware of men. They will deliver you up. They'll scourge you. But don't worry about it. You know, these things will, uh, uh, he said, uh, it'll all work out. Uh, if you're persecuted, verse 23, in one city, flee to the next. The disciple is not above his master. Uh, the servant is not above his Lord. So uh, uh, they were sent out to, uh, uh, to preach and, and, and to teach. Now, when he sent them around in, uh, uh, initially, they were to go in and they would, uh, uh, you know, the accounts, they, they would preach and teach uh, there. And then uh, uh, they would go on to the next place. You know, and it, what, uh, what happened is they would come in and they would uh, uh, preach in like a public place and there would be people that wanted them to come uh, there to their home to explain more things. And... Uh, uh, you know, Christ told them not to be just going from house to house making a pest out of themselves, but uh, those who, who invited them uh, come in and teach. And if the, uh, uh, you know, the, if the people really were teachable and were worthy in that sense, not worthy in the sense that 
Uh, they were inherently so much better than anyone else, but they had a, uh, they were worthy in their attitude. That's the way we're worthy. You know, none of us, it's not like, well, I'm, I'm worthy. I'm, I'm a lot better than he is, you know, so I'm, I'm worthy. You're not. Uh, the worthy part of it comes in if we have a humble, teachable attitude. You know, if you got that, it's amazing what you can learn and how things can fall into place. It's hard to teach somebody something who already knows everything. You ever, <laughs> you ever notice that? Uh, so Christ said, you know, gave them those instructions. And, and uh, uh, the fact of the matter was that uh, uh, as, you know, as they, uh, as they did those things, that uh, uh, people would be, would give them things. They would, you know, their needs would be provided. And ultimately, they were to learn uh, freely they had received, and they were to freely give. They weren't to go around uh, charging people for things and doing things like that. Uh, Jesus never did that. But on the other hand, uh, he uh, you, you have the account of how he was, uh, uh, you know, sent them out in that way. Now, as we uh, continue on down, we've already seen the uh, attitude that the people of Nazareth had toward uh, Jesus, and uh, he certainly didn't work many uh, miracles there. That uh, that account, by the way, is uh, it, we went through it in Mark, but you can also pick it up in uh, Matthew chapter 13. All commission to the church was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But the twelve were specifically commissioned to preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, it's interesting. What's going to be their job in, in tomorrow's world? They're going to sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. They were sent to preach to those tribes. And I'm sure if we knew all the details of the history, we would know the extent to which different ones of the apostles primarily concentrated uh, and they're, they're preaching to certain tribes. It may very well be that at least in most, if not all, cases, uh, that that will ultimately be the tribe that they actually rule over. You know, those were people that they were working with over a period of years. You know, that's not some great major doctrine, and, and I can't show you chapter and verse on it, but I can show you what their job's going to be and what they were sent to do, and it just sort of makes sense to me that... Uh, uh, the two probably have some sort of convergence, you know. It, it's uh, uh, Paul was sent in certain areas. You know, God, uh, you, you have an overall commission, then it begins to begins to to uh, break down into more specific things. The uh, and historically, of course, it's interesting uh, to go through the areas we uh, as to where the twelve apostles did go. You know, they sort of drop out of the Book of Acts after the Acts fifteen conference. You really don't read about. Uh, the twelve. Uh, you read the details of where Paul went. There were things that God simply did not choose to have recorded because uh, uh, God did allow the twelve tribes to, or the ten lost tribes to just be lost in terms of of the understanding of, of most people. He allowed that to sort of drop from, from public view. And so there are certain details that uh, uh, are simply not recorded. We don't have chapters describing, you know, where Bartholomew was and where Thomas was and where, uh, you know, Matthew was spending all this time, where uh, Simon the Zealot went, and all of those details. We, there's there are certain things that have been preserved in history, and and you can't always be a hundred percent sure of every detail of it. But but uh, uh, as you do put the story together, we find the two main areas uh, were. Uh, the area over in the east where the uh, ten tribes were, portions of them were in the area of Parthia and east of the Euphrates and then on up in northwestern Europe. Uh, the, uh, let's notice uh, uh, here in uh, uh, Christ's statement we had read uh, earlier in Matthew, uh, uh, you know, in Matthew chapter uh, 10 where Christ told them to go out and to preach 
And in the end of verse 8, see, he told them in verse Matthew 10, 8, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Uh, you know, he told them in verse 10, The workman is worthy of his meat, worthy of his food. You, know, you go out in faith and you trust that God will provide uh, your needs. Uh, freely you've received, freely give. Mr. Armstrong read those verses many decades ago in the very early part of his conversion and when he launched the uh, World of Law program, uh, Radio Church of God as it was, uh, as the radio program was there, uh, he offered things for free. He didn't get on there and ask for money. He, he uh, offered what he had for free, and he trusted that God would, would provide. You know, if you remember reading in the autobiography, he uh, asked the uh, members in the local congregation if they would pledge uh, money toward the broadcast. And he came up, seems like to me, with about half of it. I uh, didn't, and, and so he just stepped out on faith. Well, you know, God will provide. And uh, then he got on there and offered to give stuff away. Uh, that's, uh, uh, you, you know, it makes quite a contrast. You hear all these guys on there, you know, for twenty dollars, I'll send you this tape, and and uh, uh, all of these, all these things. Well, that's what Christ said, and you know, it worked. It, it worked. It, it's. Uh, uh, the uh, the truth is too precious to put up for sale. You, you know, if someone's lack of money is not the thing that ought to stand between them and and understanding the truth of God. And it just uh, you know it illustrates principle. The uh, Christ went on and uh, he told them you know that there would be persecution, uh, sometimes even government persecution. Uh, you know, here in Matthew 10:16 through 27, uh, goes through all of this, and he says, you know, they're not going. Don't expect that they're going to treat you a whole lot better than they treated me. But what claim do you and I have to be treated so much better than Jesus was treated? Uh, you know, well, I certainly deserve better treatment than he got. Well, no, you know, he can't say that. So he says, you know, it's enough for the disciple to be as his master. So don't. Don't worry about it. If they've called me Beelzebub, uh, verse 25, they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call his own household? So, you know, will we have our motives maligned? Will we have false accusations? Well, sure, that will happen from time to time. Happened to Jesus. So, uh, those kind of things. But he said, verse 26 of Matthew 10, Fear them not, therefore. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. You know, don't worry about what people say and false accusations and all sorts of things. The truth eventually will always come to the top. Sooner or later, you know, it all gets out. Don't, uh, what I tell you in darkness, speak in the light. What you hear in the ear, preach upon the housetops. Uh, you know, you ever think about that? We do that in a literal way. Where, where it is, you know, people's receivers for uh, broadcasting. Well, you know. Traditionally, up on the housetop. That's uh, not the primary meaning that he has, but it's sort of an interesting thing, you know, how, how that, that sort of worked out. Uh, Fear not them, verse 28, which are able to kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, you better fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell, in Gehenna. Uh, soul and body, uh, soul is suke. It's the word we get our word psyche. Uh, it refers uh, the body, of course, is just that soma. But uh, uh, the, the term soul, the Bible does not speak of an immortal soul. The soul is not Im- inherently immortal. But the point that he's making is the worst that a man can do to you is kill you. But you know, he has not blotted out your existence forever. He's not blotted out your your memory, your character, all the things that that give you unique individuality. God retains that, and the time is going to come when when He's going to raise when when you're resurrected. It's not just that the physical body is recreated, but the the mind, the memory, the the character, the uh, the personality, all of the the things that are uniquely you, your your suke, that that which is inherently you. You, know, you can lose a hand or an arm or a leg. Some people have lost uh, legs and arms. But you know, they're still themselves. I mean, in, in their mind. 
That's uh, Christ said, look, you don't need to worry about what people can do. You know, think about God. Because ultimately, our life is in His hands, and He's the one who can destroy both body and soul. Both, not only your body, but you. That which is uniquely, inherently you can be blotted out uh, forever. Which, of course, does show that the soul can be destroyed. I mean, that's the Protestants who, who try to use this verse, you know, some will try to use it. See, you've got an immortal soul. Well, it says the soul can be destroyed in Gehenna, so the soul doesn't burn forever in Gehenna. Soul is destroyed in Gehenna, right along with the body. He said, "Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? Uh, one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Don't worry, you are of more value than many sparrows." You know, God keeps up with things. God is aware of every detail of His creation. God has a mind that's capable of processing far more than the largest supercomputer. You know, if you could link all the supercomputers together, it wouldn't be a fraction uh, of the mind of God. Uh, you know, we, we read some of these things, and, and sometimes hard to realize how uh, literally it can be true. I think with the advent of computers, we become more conscious of how much information uh, can be stored and retrieved in, in a short time. And you realize, you know, the mind of God goes so far beyond uh, any of that. God didn't have to send somebody down to buy him a good computer because, uh, uh, you, you know, he couldn't keep up with everything. And he saw this thing that man had invented and thought he needed one. Uh, no. So Christ said, look, nothing's going to happen to you that God's not aware of. It's not like you're going to go out here and be preaching. Somebody's going to grab you and do something. And you think, man, I wish God had known about that. He, he might have done something. Uh, you know, a sparrow doesn't fall that God's unaware of. God can keep up with everything, and he certainly can keep up with you. In me. We're, he's a lot more concerned about us than he is the sparrows. We're a lot more valued. So, if God knows everything else that's going on, if God is aware of something, not, not a sparrow falls uh, that, uh, uh, you know, without God being able to be aware of that, he will keep up with us down to the most minute detail. You know, it's sort of interesting the, the expression Christ used the very hairs of your head are numbered. You know, that means not only is God keep up with something, but He has to keep up with it on an ongoing basis because that's a number that's constantly changing. <laughs> now, He has less trouble with some of us than He does with others, doesn't He? <laughs> some of us take a lot, you know, less of His attention. He doesn't have to count as high. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, there, there are several of us that fall into that category. But... Uh, uh, the point that he's making is I'm sending you out to do something. Yes, you're going to encounter ad, uh, adversaries. You're going to encounter trouble and difficulty. Don't be intimidated by it. Don't worry about what people say, what people accuse you of, what people threaten you with. You concentrate on really walking with God, on really going forward, doing what God has you know, sent you to do. You just concentrate on that, and it'll all fall into place. Everything will will uh, uh, will come together. And uh, he says, "If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. You deny me before men, I'll deny you before uh, my Father." You know, we've got to be prepared to stand up for what is uh, right, not to deny uh, Jesus Christ. You know, we don't want him to be ashamed of us, and we therefore would better not be ashamed of him. He says in verse 34, Don't think I've come to send peace on earth. I didn't come to send peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her, uh, uh, against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's foes will be those of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, Christ didn't mean that he just wanted to see people fight and have trouble. What he said was, look, if you follow me, you may run into conflict and difficulty even in your own family. You know, many of us had that experience years ago. Uh, I guess one of my... I've, I've told the story several times uh, because... To this day, one of the most vivid memories of, of my life is the first Christmas I didn't keep. You know, 
we, we in many cases, saw families thrown into turmoil. We saw upset and problems. And some people had more trouble than others did. But it came down to the fact that when you start following Jesus Christ, you're not going to be in the mainstream of society. That's not what the rest of the world is doing. That doesn't mean you try to make conflict in your family, but it means that, that Christ has to come first. Well, you know, God won't take second place. That's, that's not acceptable in, in His life. And, you know, oftentimes, I think in you know, so many cases, as time goes by, by our example, we can certainly impact our families in a positive way, and, and uh, they may get over some of the initial hurt and, 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 and upset because they didn't understand and things can be uh, resolved. But what we have to come down to, none of us know, um, you know, what's happened. I've known people that have literally been thrown out because they were going to obey God. They were going to keep the Sabbath or, or some of these things and just you know, get out. Well, we have to to be prepared to accept the consequences, to realize that uh, many times there are problems even in a family because some understand and others don't. But if we, we have to put Christ first, uh, Matthew 10.38, He that takes not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake uh, shall find it. So you see, the uh, if the primary thing we're after is protecting ourselves, then we're uh, uh, not going to we're not going to be successful. Uh, we just have to follow. We, we have to take up whatever our responsibility is and follow. And instead of putting our primary focus on this physical life and all the things accompanied with that, uh, that we're prepared to lose our life for His sake. We, uh, uh, in that sense, sacrifice our self uh, to follow Him and that ultimately we'll have real life, eternal life. Uh, he goes on, He that receives you receives me. He that receives me receives him that sent me. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. He that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever shall give a drink to one of these little ones, a cup of water, only in the name of a disciple, truly I say, he'll in no wise lose his reward. You know, we... we uh, uh, find that uh, the way we treat uh, Christ's representatives is, is certainly taken uh, personally uh, by Him. Now, let's uh, go back here and mark once again. We, uh, we saw in Mark 6-7, He called the twelve and sent them out two by two. And... Uh, uh, so we're told that, uh, uh, as he said in in, uh, in verse 12 of Mark 6, they went out and preached that men should repent. That's what they preached. They uh, told people that they needed to turn their lives around. They cast out many demons, anointed with oil many that were sick, and healed them. Now Herod, King Herod, heard about it. And uh, Herod was a superstitious sort. Uh, he heard about it, and he got all worried. Uh, he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. Uh, you know, he's come back to haunt me. Uh, Herod was, you know, Herod knew that uh, he shouldn't have beheaded John the Baptist. And evidently that had sort of worked on him. He'd been uh, uh, nervous about it. We, the, the account is, is told here as to what had happened. That uh, um, John the Baptist had preached a sermon and... Uh, uh, Herod had thrown him in jail because John had told Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Uh, you know, Herod and, and his brother's wife sort of moved in together and uh, that was uh, uh, immoral and John the Baptist didn't pull any punches. And uh, uh, Herodias, his brother's wife that he was living with, was all upset and she, was, uh, she wanted John the Baptist killed. Herod, verse 20, feared John. He knew that he was just and holy 
and and uh, he would listen to him, and uh, you know he liked to hear some of what John had to say. Uh, he uh, he was impressed with John. He knew John was right, and uh, so he at least had a certain respect. But Herod was a weak uh, kind of a fellow who basically gave in to his own appetites and his own uh, vanities and jealousies and lusts, and so uh, he was having a big birthday party. And uh, the daughter of Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod. And uh, uh, the king said to the damsel, Ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. This was not a little six-year-old that came in and did a tap dance. Uh, She probably was young. She may not have been more than even 12 or 13, 14, something. She was probably fairly young, but uh, she was old enough. Old enough that uh, Herod and his... uh, uh, lust got all uh, uh, stirred up, and he uh, said, "You know, I'll give you what you. I'll give you anything you ask." Uh, the uh, and uh, this has been popularized as uh, what was called Salome's uh, Dance of the Seven Veils. And so, uh, uh, evidently, she got rid of some of the veils somewhere along the line, uh, and. Uh, just to show you how corrupt morally the whole family was. You know, Mrs. Herod knew what... She knew what the results of this was going to be. And so, you know, here her daughter's going down here, and she'd already put her daughter up to it. Uh, Yeah, you get get him all stirred up, and then when he uh, makes you an offer, you come check with me. So she came back and asked her mother, and her mother said, you tell him, that what you want is John the Baptist's head on a charger. And uh, so uh, we're told the king was exceeding sorry. Matthew uh, or Mark uh, uh, Mark 6.26. He was exceeding sorry. But uh, he was embarrassed to back down now in front of everybody. So he sent an executioner and had John the Baptist beheaded. And they brought this grisly thing on a plate to the girl, and she carried it to her mother. And the disi- John's disciples came and took up his corpse and laid it in the tomb. Uh, so uh, uh, Matthew gives in a couple of uh, extra details. Uh, it tells about uh, uh, Matthew 14, starts out, you know, Herod the Tetrarch, hearing of John, and gives the same account. And uh, uh, it... it uh, goes on down uh, basically through the uh, uh, you know through the same thing so uh, uh, anyway uh, we, we come down to the uh, uh, you know the end of this uh, of this section and what we will do uh, as we uh, uh, come on to uh, the next time we will uh, uh, we will see that uh, that the account brings us down to the uh, the time of the uh, right before the Passover. That's where this ends up. You don't know that yet. But next time we'll see that there's an account that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all four give, and John makes it plain that it occurred right before the Passover. That was the feeding of the five thousand, which. Uh, uh, you come right on into that here, Mark 6, 30 on down. So basically what we've done is, is come up uh, this period of several months. It brings us up to where next time we'll be uh, starting in on the last year of Christ's life. And what we'll find is that the further we go through, uh, the more details that are given, the more, in effect, the account sort of slows down and focuses in uh, on detail. So uh, with that, we'll be uh, concluded here this evening, and I've got study questions.